G'day everyone, welcome back to the Nerd Cave. Sorry it's been so long. We are streaming live on YouTube, hopefully in 4K. It's gonna be a chance to demo the new Lauer Nanomorph and size it up against, obviously, a much more expensive and much more established anamorphic lens, but I think it's gonna be a really interesting comparison and it's gonna be able to, these two options are gonna fit a lot of different markets and a lot of different use cases. Um, so why don't we get into it and have a quick look at the Nanomorph itself. Um, oh, and David White, thanks for, letting us know that 4K is working. So look, I've managed to somehow get five 4K camera angles into vMix, which I'll quickly take you through in a second, but um, thanks for that little bit of reassurance to, to know that it's actually working, much appreciated. So let's have a quick look at the Nanomorph itself. So there it is, sitting on the Red Raptor. That's the 50 mil there, and look how tiny that thing is. Let me just um, hold up. This is the 65 mil Atlas Orion there, just as a little size comparison. And I've included the RF to EF adapter on the back there so that it is a true apples with apples comparison. Because one of the really great things about these nanomorphs is they can come in mirrorless mounts, such as this RF native mount, which goes straight on the Raptor without an adapter. That rhymed. Uh, and gives you a really low profile, um, really compact build. Now, the size of this thing actually introduces a few challenges which we'll chat about in a second, particularly with an example I've got over there on the Canon C70. Um, but, I mean, the, when these arrived, the first thing that hit me was how the hell have they managed to squeeze that much glass into such a small package? I mean, anamorphic takes some serious optics to be able to do what it does. So I've just got this here on the Raptor with a little uh, Nucleus M motor and um, just a little hand grip on the tripod pan handle there so I can pull focus. And we'll have a look at the footage in a second, but why don't I just quickly take you around, show you the different camera angles so you get a feel for what we're gonna play with today. So we've got a C70 here, which is on a little Red Rock Micro one-man crew, providing a nice little autonomous dolly angle that kind of has a slight curve to it, so it sort of holds its focal length. Um, I've hooked up the little, uh, a nucleus nano motor to it, so I do actually have the ability to pull focus there. There you can see the little oval bokeh of the cheesy fairy lights I put in the background, both for technical purposes and because, you know, it's almost Christmas, yeehaw. Uh, next up, we've got a red Komodo with, uh, that's the Orion 40 mil that we're gonna be using for comparison there. Um, and that's running uh, at on, on the Komodo, what it's called is 6K, you'll see there at the bottom, 4x3, 2X. The 2X refers to the squeeze factor of the anamorphic, so how much it's actually squeezing the world optically into the sensor, and then when you get into post, you stretch it back out, and that's how you get all the funky awesomeness of anamorphic. Um, then if we move across here, we've got the nano, new, the Lauer Nanomorph 35 mil on another uh, Komodo, and this one's mounted on the DJI RS3 Pro. So as you can see here, I've got my little remote control here that I actually stole out of a tilter float system that I'll probably never use. So this works out to be about a $2,000 controller, but it actually has come in really handy. I'm gonna do another episode pretty soon on showing you how I managed to get the RS3 Pro mounted on top of my Steadicam Zephyr which actually turns it into like a poor man's Ari Trinity. So if anyone's keen to check that out, let me know. Uh, other camera angles we've got here, the one that I was just showing you before was the C500 Mark II, which has got a, um, a Sigma 35mm 1.4 on there. I think I'm actually running it at 2.8 at the moment. And then we've got the Raptor, which is the one that's got the Lauer 50mm on there. So if I just let this one free, you can see there, that's the Raptor. And later on, I'll be able to uh, change the project settings on the Raptor just to give you an idea of coverage. So at the moment, this Raptor is running at 6K, 16.9, 1.5 squeeze, and it's obviously capable of going up to 8K, so you'll be able to see how the uh, coverage of that works out. So what I might do now is grab the old phone with the magic of NDI and just race around the room and show you all the different rigs so you've got a feeling for what we're playing with today. So yeah, we're running the 40 mil at about 2.8, because just to sort of match up to, oh, this one actually can go to 2.4, but I think we've, I've stopped this one down a little bit just to help with the sharpness. And so as far as the rigs go, this one's got, so it's a Komodo here with the Ignite Digi cage around it. Um, that This big box here is actually my tally light, so it tells me it goes green when I'm in preview and goes red when that camera's actually been selected. Up the top here is the Teradek RT range finder, which is, the, they call it the TOF1. Uh, and around the side there, you'll see 
That's the MDR for the Teradek, so that lets me plug up to three motors or two motors in the rangefinder um, into the red there. And uh, what else can I show you on that one? It's basically just sitting on a tripod, nothing fancy there. And then over here, we've got another Komodo with the Nanomorph 35 mil, 1.5 times squeeze. Up the top here is the ridiculously capable DJI, DJI LiDAR focus, which we're gonna talk about and do a little comparison between the two and see how they go. Uh, as you'll see here, this is kind of what I was referring to before, the build side, the, the actual diameter of these lenses is so small that one thing you're gonna to have to really keep in mind is how you mount your focus gears. So you can see here, it's okay on a Komodo because the Komodo is quite a small camera body, but if you start getting up into a bigger camera body with little focus systems like this DJI, you're gonna end up where it's just, it's, it's gonna end up hanging down below the lens and never being able to make contact with the gears. So that's something to think about. Over here, we've got the Canon C70. And this is the one where I found it really, really difficult to mount a motor and actually getting it to make contact with the lens because of how small these lenses are. I actually ended up using the base plate that came with the Nucleus Nano, which when I first bought that system, I almost threw it in the bin because I figured I'd never use it. But here it comes being extremely uh, useful. And I'm powering that focus motor off this really sexy battery pack, which completely doesn't match everything else, but I'll get over that. And one thing to note as well, at the moment, the C70 only has anamorphic modes for two times and 1.8 times squeeze. It actually, sorry, 1.3 times squeeze. It doesn't actually do 1.5 times squeeze. So it's not a huge issue because all it's doing is really showing you a preview that's sort of an approximation of what the anamorphic is gonna be. So I'm actually running this uh, at 1.3 squeeze on the LCD there, which you can sort of see. And then I'm running it into this Shogun here. And the Shogun's actually got Sorry, let me turn that off. I'm actually using the anamorphic um, stretch in the Shogun to provide, probably can't, probably won't show up too well there, but the Shogun's actually compressing that to 1.5 accurately for me. When that goes back into vMix, it actually comes through um, completely uh, in its native form. So then you have to do the scaling in vMix to make that work. Over here on the Canon C500, again, I've got the flex light, sorry, flex tally on the top there to tell me when the camera goes live. And it's got a little Sigma 35 mil, and it's the hero shot for the Raptor, which has the Nanomore 50 mil. Got a little zoom uh, focus controller there on the pan handle. And we've got the Nucleus M motor. So again, I had to sort of get a little creative to be able to make, get that to make contact with the lens. So coming off a little stub rail off the top there to be able to get close enough to make contact. So yeah, just something worth thinking about in terms of how these lenses work. And then in the background, like I said, some really sloppy art direction in terms of the fairy lights, but they're gonna provide us a little bit of a technical help later on. All right, so let me cut to something a little more useful like that. Welcome back. All right, hope that helped you get a bit of a rough idea. We might refer to the phone again later just to show you particularly some of the things on the RS3 Pro for people who haven't played around with the Active Track or the DJI LiDAR Focus. Um, so why don't we get straight into a comparison between the two so I can, I'll get you a little bit of a top and tail here, which is on the top, we've got the Orion, which is on a Komodo. The bottom is the Nanomorph 35 mil. Again, that's on a Komodo. And the settings are all pretty standardized. So I've tried to make them as close as possible. But you know, you can see you're getting a fairly commensurate kind of a framing. I've moved, because the Nanomorph's a 35 mil and the Atlas is a 40 mil, I've just moved the 35 mil a little closer to me to kind of match the framing. Um, one thing that I guess stood out to me straight away when I saw them side by side was the, uh, the Orion has more of a green tinge to it, um, which I actually like. I, th I find it a little bit more pleasing. The Nanomorph, tends to skew a little more magenta and a little more into the blues. The flares is probably the, the, the most noticeable thing that people remember about anamorphic. You can see here, both the cameras are picking up some fairly nice little flares off my gratuitous anamorphic flare lights. We've got the Dito 150s in the back there, two of them. Um, the Orion's getting a little bit more funk to its flare, so you can see it's got some of those little kind of wavy patterns in there, whereas the Nanomorph, it's more of just your straight kind of surgical blue line. Worth noting that the Nanomorphs, you can actually order them with three different colors. You can get silver, 
Amber, I think it is, or orange or amber, and then blue. So this is obviously the blue variant of that. Just quickly on mounts as well, the Nanomorphs can come in a range of different mirrorless mounts. I've gone with the RF version, but I think you can get E-mount and a few others. Um, and then you can also get it with your more standard EF mount or PL mount, which is a larger lens. I actually put more, there's more of a, um, a housing on the back of it to facilitate that. So it makes the lens actually physically bigger if you're going for EF or PL. Um, but yeah, just with this kind of a mirrorless setup, it's a really nice little compact um, unit. One of the other things that most people notice when it comes to anamorphics is the strange bokeh characteristics. So part of the reason why I've got the fairy lights here is out of focus points of light on a spherical lens, a standard lens will be circular. So let's have a look here. If I go to the C500 and you'll see there, the fairy lights in the background are little circles. Whereas if I go to the C70 and then rack it out of focus, you can see there, there's an elliptical shape to the out of focus uh, lights. And that's less pronounced on the 1.5 squeeze than it is on the two. Let me just give you a little example of that. See if I can find my focus again. So if we go back to the, the side by side comparison, if I move up towards this lens here, you're gonna see what I was talking about before with the out of focus lights. So you can see there, they're a little bit more elliptical or a little more vertically stretched on the Orion at the top than they are on the Nanomorph at the bottom. And again, that's because the Orion's a two times squeeze, whereas the Nanomorph is a 1.5 times squeeze. And while we're here, I guess you can kind of get a feel for how these focus systems work. So this one at the top, the Orion, is a very directional, fairly narrow beam system in terms of the rangefinder. Like if I, if I move my head over this way, you'll see it pretty quickly pulls to the background. I can come back in, it's, it's pretty snappy. But yeah, there's not a heap of tolerance in terms of the width of this thing and how it picks up the subject. So if the subject's not kind of center framed, assuming that you've got the range finder pointing straight in the center, as soon as they move off axis, it's gonna lose them. So that's something to consider. I mean, they're, they're not necessarily designed to be used for autofocus. That's just a little bonus that, that um, Teradek have enabled with the firmware. Um, they're mostly for focus pullers to actually figure out the range of the subject and they'll get a little readout on screen if they use the small HD monitors and they can just use that range to kind of make decisions about what they're gonna pull focus to. Um, whereas with the Nanomorph, it's actually using a, a kind of a face detect to pick me up. That's why I'm able to move basically anywhere in the frame and it's keeping me pretty tack sharp. As far as minimums go, sorry to shove my face right in your screens, everybody. You can see there, I'm just past it. So that's about the minimums there of the 35 mil nanomorph. And then I don't actually have a preview of this one, so I'm just guessing, but if I keep coming forward, that's minimums there on the 40 mil. And you can see that the, uh, the DJI focus has lost me. But if I pop back in here, you can see how quickly that zaps back in. So there's a little preview on how those range finders work. I definitely found the Nanomorph was sharper in a way that I didn't like as much as the Orion. I mean, digital sensors are so clinical and so clean. A lot of people go and seek out things like super speeds or vintage lenses or anything like that to try and take the edge off the digital look and give it, make it feel a little bit more organic, a little bit more messed up. So if I head in here into the, give you a little look at this. So if you swipe across on the control screen, the, the LiDAR's actually got a camera inside it. That's what that guy on the left there is. So this, this part's the LiDAR and that's a camera. And that's the preview of the camera. So it's actually showing you what the LiDAR's looking at. And the little box around there is my noggin and it's telling me how far I am. To, to calibrate this, you only need to tell the, the LiDAR system two focus points. It asks you to focus on something for every lens that is. It asks you to focus on, some, focus on something a meter away and then four meters away. And just by getting those two measurements, it somehow manages to build a profile of that lens and accurately uh, pull focus on manual lenses, which is crazy. Let me just show you what you get here with the rangefinder. So at the moment it's flashing red. So what you wanna do is you push function twice, double tap, and that's gonna start an auto calibration on the lens. And when that finishes, you should get a solid red light. And that means that the, it's currently usable with the, where's he gone? The little focus wheel here. So if I spin that, you'll see I'm able to use it as a follow focus. But now if I push this or AF MF button, the light goes green. And now you've got 
autofocus happening. So it can hold three lens profiles. So if I go back down here, move this around so you can get my ugly mug in there, but catch all that funky looking bokeh in the background. Swipe across, you can see the preview there. Let's see if this active track's deciding to work. There you go. Let me just double check what setting I'm on. So if I go into active track, I'm on slow. Let me crank it up to fast. Now you can get a feel for how that follow happens. So there's your active track working. It's got funny ideas on how to frame, but still, it's kind of cool. I can, there you go, got, got some framing back there. I can see some use cases for that. Now, if I jump back here, I'll just quickly show you. So you can see the lens profile. At the moment, I've got two in here. The top one there, that's my Solaire HS 25mm um, that I actually run with a speed booster on the Komodo. And this thing, so it basically means I'm shooting effectively T.9. And this rangefinder basically holds focus perfectly. Like tack sharp, even with the minimums on the Solaire, I think is something like about here. And it'll actually hold something tack sharp all the way up to that. It's crazy impressive. So I had that on a job the other day with the RS3 Pro on the top of my Steadicam Zephyr. And I was using it kind of like an Arri Trinity so I could rotate the post down to the ground, have the camera skimming along the ground, and then bring it up to head height. Just running around like a maniac, didn't have to worry about focus at all, completely wide open on a Solaire at 0 0.9, and this thing held it the whole way. So there, yeah, the second profile I've got, there's the um, 35 mil. Unfortunately, you can't put any other kind of identifiers in there, so I can't say, hey, it's an anamorphic, so you just have to remember which lens is which. And then you could hold the third one in there as well. So that's the, that's the case. So you can see there how the TOF one's handling the focus. <laughs> oh, the DJI is just winning. It's, 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 it's tough being a $15,000 rangefinder and not being able to match up to a $750 one. So if I pop this guy, grab these couple of things. So you can see there, so there's the ones I've got now, the 27, 35, and 50. And then they've got a spot here for the 65 T2.4 and an 80 mil T2.4. So good to see that there's a bit of a, you know, future pipeline of lenses that are gonna come out. So yeah, if, if you've got any other questions, hit me up on Instagram. Thanks so much, everyone. Might call it a day there and uh, look forward to seeing you on the next one. Cheers.